Gordon does, yeah. The button, okay. So it's been a very busy two months and we have lots of good news to share. And while everyone knows this, it's just worthy of, uh, to take the time to recognize that the county in 10 cities uh, in the county have at, at a minimum taken the step to pass the community choice ordinance indicating their willingness to join Peninsula Clean Energy. So that is a big deal. So let me um, read those names. Um, uh, in addition to the County of San Mateo, we have Atherton, the City of San Mateo, Menlo Park, Half Moon Bay, East Palo Alto, San Carlos, Daly City, Belmont, Woodside, and Portola Valley. So uh, an incredible diversity of communities that have all um, come together to launch Peninsula Community Energy. We certainly have, uh, we're going to have more cities. I think there's, a, there's a, a decent chance we may have all the cities, but we're going to have more than we have now. We're going to have uh, uh, most, if not all, of the cities. And I, that is really a remarkable thing that um, we could do that and do it in the kind of methodical, timely, and I think transparent way that we, we've done. So I do want to thank uh, everyone in the room here for their, their efforts to get us to where we are. Uh, the city staff have been, have been terrific. The, you know, the council members have been terrific. Our, our advocates, the San Mateo community advocates, have been uh, working through this whole process. I'm going to give a little shout out to Jan Butts, who I see at almost every meeting. I thought we were there. So we're all learning about all the city halls. In, uh, we're going to do a little architectural digest of all the city halls. So Jan has been remarkable, but, um, and, and as of so many others uh, in the room. Um, so we couldn't be, we could be more pleased by the progress that, that, that we've made. Uh, and the other, another exciting thing in the last two months that, of course, everyone is, is, is familiar with, but we'll just briefly touch on, is um, we saw a, a great debate uh, uh, at the end of the year about the exit fee, the so-called so -called PCIA fee, which, as I'm sure everyone knows, was increased by almost 100%. Um, we, in our modeling, anticipated a substantial, a substantial rise. Uh, I believe we modeled 70%. And you know, to make a long story short, the fact, the fact that the, our, the energy market is so favorable right now that, the, that the, the pricing is so good, which is really a positive thing for us as we contemplate a launch, the flip side of that is, um, under law, we have to cover the stranded costs of PG&E and therefore the delta between their, their historical contract prices and this, the current energy market is, is bigger. Um, we have no idea whether it justifies 95%. It's not a transparent process. And there are a lot of issues that need to be resolved with the PCIA calculation. But it was quite remarkable. It became a front page news story. You know, leaders from all over the state in, engaged in the debate. Um, so it, I think it's really testimony to the fact that Community choice energy is is really you know emerging uh, as a powerful model uh, you know you know th throughout California to, to to generate that kind of uh, attention on what a year ago would have been kind of an inside regulatory change. Um, there will be a you know one positive note from you know while we were not successful in convincing the CPUC to. Uh, uh, lower that rate or to consider it further, they, they did agree to hold a, a, a workshop, which is a, it's a kind of a quasi-regulatory proceeding, as I understand, where they will convene in March, um, and, and it will provide an opportunity to get into a lot of the details, so-called vintaging issue, how long should these contracts, uh, should they stay in, in effect, when do these fees roll off, are there any possibilities for smoothing these fees, um, uh, those kind of questions. Um, everyone recognizes that uh, there is an obligation to cover those costs, it's, but uh, it's like so many things in life, right? Devil in detail. How in the world do you calculate them, and how, do, how does everyone f come away feeling like, okay, we, that's a fair deal? So, um, again, a very busy two months, and of course, we had to take a little time off for the holidays in the middle of all that, and uh, we have a lot, to, but a lot has been accomplished, and our momentum is, is really strong. Um, I don't know if you have any other wor any words, uh, Supervisor Groom, or other 
Um, so with that, uh, we will go ahead and uh, look at the minutes, approve the minutes. If uh, anyone have any comments or revisions? Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Okay, we have a motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Oh, yeah. Why don't you go ahead and say that? Sure. Um, I want to Here you go. I want to offer the th thanks to Mayor Gothels for uh, nominating and appointing the uh, this advisory committee to the Mayor's Award in the City of San Mateo for their annual uh, yearly awards program. And we really appreciate that, Joe. That was very thoughtful of you and uh, very bold. So if we can win awards now, just think how many we're going to get in a year. Uh, okay, so uh, unless there's any, uh, any dissent or any opposition or abstention on the minutes, we'll consider those unanimously approved. Uh, the next item is public comment. We would welcome any comment from people in the audience if they want to share anything with the advisory board tonight. Yes, come on if you would introduce yourself. Uh, my name is John Murray, and I'm here with Mireille Bellany. We're residents in uh, Ladera, the small community between Portola Valley and uh, uh, Menlo Park, just off uh, Alpine Road. Um, there's about 1,500 people there. And the first, uh, I, th I believe, our, our community association, the first that we, we had heard of, of uh, this initiative was uh, a couple of months ago when uh, uh, Jeff in uh, Portola Valley and our neighbors uh, ran a couple of public meetings there. Uh, to um, to raise awareness within that community, um, I w I'd like to make sure that the outreach uh, plans for the, for the organisation really does um, get get as much input as possible from communities such as ours. Um, it seems that you know everyone in the cities has been uh, at, at least has had an opportunity to come forward, but um, I think perhaps in the unincorporated areas there hasn't been that much. Uh, uh, that much involvement so far. Um, I think that, that's basically it. We've got all the usual questions about um, the opt-in, opt-out rates and uh, future pricing and all of that sort of thing. Uh, but I'd really like to find out eventually how our community, uh, Ladera Community Association, can be involved in part of this process as we go forward. Well, thank you for uh, joining us and we would uh, like to get you, ver get you involved. Um, Jim Egemeyer is sitting right in front of you. Maybe you guys could exchange information. We'd, we'd be happy to come out and do a presentation uh, to the Ladera Association. We, um, through the process, have done a, a lot of outreach. There's always more to do. Uh, there, we are, and I think uh, Mr. Egemeyer will speak to our, the next phase of the process where we are hiring a marketing and outreach uh, firm. Uh, so that we can, can re make sure we uh, our outreach is much broader. So appreciate your, your comments. So tonight's agenda, um, we'll start with um, uh, some other updates uh, from Jim Angermeyer. Uh, we'll then turn to um, Pacific Energy Advisors who are going to talk a little bit about the, the, the energy scenarios. As you know from the technical study, we modeled three scenarios but there's been uh, some discussion about uh, you know, how, how those, particularly the mid-model, you know, what potential variants might, might be worthy of consideration there. And the bulk of the meeting will be to uh, talk about the, uh, uh, the implementation plan, which is a, a, a critical document required by the CU, CPUC and uh, would, be, would be reviewed and uh, filed by the Joint Powers Authority towards the end of March, if I remember the schedule correctly. So that's, uh, that's our, our work for tonight. We can start with uh, Mr. Egemeyer. Good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight, let's see, uh, one more slide, please. Kirsten, thank you. Um, Supervisor Pine basically summarized the cities that so far have, in fact, joined the JPA here. So um, we've kind of gone through that one, so I'll move on to the next one. Over the past two months, uh, a number of activities that um, have taken place 
uh, throughout our office and also with um, Lean Energy um, participating with us. Uh, community workshops in Portola Valley, the Rotary Club in, in La Park, Sam Cita. We also had two new council member workshops for um, bringing a number of council members up to speed on our efforts around CCA and PCE in uh, San Mateo County. Also, neighborhood associations with Daly City, the 350 Bay Area, also joint venture Silicon Valley, community workshop in Daly City, and then finally, uh, the Woodside Portola Valley Rotary Club. So we've been getting out, pounding the pavement, and spreading the word on this, and um, handing out our brochures left and right. And um, so it's a good segue into kind of our communications and marketing. A few months ago, we sent out an RFP for the next phase relative to outreach that this JPA is going to need to do. And we had four proposals come back and we've shortlisted one particular firm that really stood out with that, and we're gonna be doing a kind of a, um, an interview with them and understanding their process, making sure it aligns with what we need to do and what we're going to do and looking at the costs associated with that. So we are in fact close to um, securing a contract for our major marketing and outreach efforts here for the um, phase two and phase three. Phase three really is the JPA um, and in initiating the, um, the rate setting and the information that goes out to all the particular customers that will be part of this particular PCE effort. We've also um, um, taken our outreach materials and um, they're now in three other languages, Chinese, Tagalog, and uh, Spanish. And there are a number of those out on uh, the table out there, so please feel free to grab those um, as you leave, to be able to take back to your cities and other constituents, folks that you know, that could benefit from the other languages that we're providing here. And then the next item, the net metering and solar FAQ sheet, we've spent um, a lot of time on that, and now that is posted back to our resources page of our um, um, outreach and uh, website. And so I wanted to let you know, and then we had a lot of um, interaction too with uh, PEA, Pacific Energy Advisors, they're here tonight, and just so that we were able to really uh, drill down in the Q&A relative to the uh, net metering aspect. And now we've also um, recently surpassed our 600 people on our mailing list, so we're really encouraged about kind of how quickly this is um, getting out and about to everybody. So we're really happy about that. So um, the next thing I want to share with everybody here is um, something that behind the scenes that the Office of Sustainability um, undertook. And what, um, well, I may, let me back up first here. Um, we've, um, a few weeks ago, I'm going to talk about kind of a, a more detailed performa analysis. A few weeks ago, we worked with PEA to take the uh, existing pro forma, which was for the technical study and identified all 20 cities to really kind of come to the understanding of whether or not this would be doable. So what we now um, worked with PEA on was refinement and we identified what we thought were the 12 most um, obvious cities that would be joining the, the JPA as of a few weeks ago and had them rerun um, the analysis and their, through their formulas knowing the exit fee now is um, relative to the PG&E as well as the current rates and the kind of the uh, volume of electricity that we would need. So we've taken another run at this performa analysis and this is also going to be a very important aspect in the next week or two as we start to meet with um, particular banks in San Mateo County to understand kind of our relationship with banks and um, the relationship for moving forward and um, understanding the monies that will be necessary later on, the capital for um, working this JPA into a small business. So I wanted to kind of share that with you and kind of those efforts that we've been going through. Um, 
we also um, have refined the risk analysis. Uh, there was another couple of functions that we asked PEA to do, and that was to look and extract out of the um, technical study and essentially put it into a um, kind of a table format, the risk associated with the um, essentially st the startup of the um, of PEA or P uh, PCE. So that's another document too that's in the kind of the little final refinements that we'll be posting on um, our website that really shows and summarizes the risk analysis. We essentially put it into three categories of high, medium, and low in a number of different categories and then kind of the mitigation measures associated with that. So we're fine tuning that and so um, we'll be having that available. And then also um, um, back in the month of December, uh, I issued an RFP for a peer review of the technical study, and we secured the firm MRW, and over the course of this last month, and MRW is another all um, uh, kind of a competitor or also um, in the same market as PEMA Associates. And so they took a look at the technical study and this past Monday, they gave us a draft copy of that. And so I've already started making some refinements on that. But I, what I really wanted to share with you are a couple sentences, just uh, so you know and understand their work. So th they spent a month looking at um, PEA's document and also the um, risk analysis um, table and basically uh, essentially came up with a couple of um, kind of the summary and the executive summary of this document. And I'll read this. Overall, MRW finds that the study was thorough and professionally performed. We found no fatal flaws or major assumptions that require revision. Overall, the study is sound. So they've provided here with, uh, to us a document that's um, 16 pages, and we're going to be over the next couple weeks kind of refine that. We think this, too, kind of validates the efforts that PEA went through and helps us understand that we really do have a sound technical study moving forward. Okay, so um, kind of the, the next steps that we're looking at here uh, with city councils that we're aware of um, include Foster City next week, Burlingame, Brisbane, Pacifica, Redwood City, Millbrae, and Colma. So if we've forgotten anybody, please let us know, and um, we can continue to update our um, schedule here. And then also here's a kind of a summary of the different cities having study sessions, first readings and second readings that have occurred, and um, adoption of their JPA um, resolution. Yeah, could you go back to the, slide, the prior slide about next week? Uh, those are all first readings, right? Correct. So that's one, two, three, four. So that's potentially, potentially seven more right. members. Yes. So we have 11. With this, we'd be up to 18. And that still leaves three other cities. Um, right. OK. Excellent. OK. So 20 is, uh, is this in our, within our grasp? Twenty cities. Yes. Areas. Oh, and the one last thing too. Um, we're also um, San Mateo County. You know, our office is in the process right now of hiring one full-time limited-term position as a coordinator for all our um, efforts here. Um, in the past, it's been um, Gordon and Kirsten, and um, there's a lot of work that needs to happen over the course of the, the next six months. So we're in the process of hiring a full-time person. And so two weeks ago, we announced this. And basically, um, we, the deadline was yesterday, last night. We had um, over 70 applications for this position. And from that, um, the after, or all day today, Gordon and Kirsten reviewed 48 of those that were in that to get it down to what we'll be interviewing next week. So just wanted to let you know kind of how, how exciting it was just to have that many responses on this, uh, just for this particular job and the efforts. This person essentially would be taking um, what Gordon and Kirsten do part time and doing that full time. So I have two people there and then they will continue to be assisting this new person as well. 
So we're excited about that. So that concludes my update for you tonight. And um, oh, but before I go, I had two shout outs. I wanted to kind of tag on to Supervisor Pine about Jan Butts. I too have gone to other meetings and turn around and there she is. And I just want to say thank you so much for all your efforts. It's just been wonderful. So thank you. And then also behind the scenes too, Gordon and Kirsten. Couldn't do it yeah. without them. Thank you. Are there questions for Jim? Um, we covered a fair amount of material here. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Jim. All right, well, welcome um, Pacific Energy Associates. Good evening, everybody. I'm John Delessi with Pacific Energy Advisors. And um, so we've got a couple of things in a row here on the agenda. The first, um, the first one is this alternative scenario that I'll cover. And then the, this should go pretty quick. And then the, the next um, item is the implementation plan. So the, uh, this fourth scenario that we looked at, so if you recall from the, the technical study that we completed back in October, uh, we looked at three supply scenarios that that PCE potentially um, you know, could uh, procure and, and offer uh, those resource mixes to its customers. And the first scenario was really looked at a minimum cost portfolio, so just bare compliance with the renewable standards, really focus on what, what's possible in regards to um, reducing costs and, and providing savings to ratepayers. Um, the second scenario was a 50%, starting with 50% renewable energy content, so exceeding um, the, the regulatory requirements and exceeding what's expected that PG&E would be providing through um, to its customers. And then the third scenario was 100% um, renewable energy. So the, the way that it, it all sort of shook out was that scenario one provided, it was expected to provide savings to customers Scenario two was expected to also provide savings to customers, but on average about a 3% reduction um, for, for customers, but providing additional um, environmental benefit. And then scenario three, which was the 100% renewable scenario, um, was projected to be more costly than the service from, from PG&E by, I think it was um, about 2% on average. So the question, uh, came back to us is, well, what would a scenario look like that is sort of in between two and three? Like, what, where, where do we essentially break even or achieve rate parity with, um, with PG&E? And so we went in and uh, looked at that and reran the models and found that essentially uh, about an 80% renewable energy content um, uh, would be achievable at about the same cost as charged by PG&E. So, um, you know, I think this, this discussion or, th or this scenario it sort of plays into some of the, the discussion around the implementation plan. Uh, one of the key issues that we'll need to collectively grapple with in developing the implementation plan is, you know, what is it that we want to commit to in terms of the retail service that's going to be offered to customers? Is it a 50% renewable content? Is it a 75% renewable content? What, what is it? Um, but just to answer the question, you know, sort of that break-even um, uh, portfolio w equates to about 80% renewable energy. Any, any questions on that before we move to the next subject? Yes, sir. That's 80% yeah. RPS? 80% RPS, correct, yes. Uh, so <clears throat> there are... I'll say four rulemakings going on right now, residential rates, distributed resources. Uh, how robust is that 80% to how, I mean, like the, the new successor net metering tariff, how, you know, if there was any sort of wiggle room for, based on those four things, and I know that's a lot of uncertainty of dealing with the next two years, but what, what do you, where do you think we stand with that? Right, so, you know, what we said in the technical, technical study is that we'd put about a plus or minus 5% parameter um, on these on these estimates because of all the various uncertainties, those that you mentioned. The PCIA is a big one. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about what's that break-even number, 
you, we wouldn't advise practically that's, that's what you offer because there's, I think what you'd want to do is leave some cushion, right? So you'd want to set that renewable content that you're, that you're committing to at a lower level um, just in case there are unanticipated cost increases or something kind of goes wrong, right? So, um, would the, like a 10% cushion you think be enough, or would you recommend more like 15 or 20? Where, where would you know? That's um, I think maybe we could circle back to that question. That's one of the issues that that's going to be teed up in the okay. in the next uh, agenda item. So um, it seems like you're making another assumption there as well, which is that a short-term gain or short-term highest percentage achievable is what we're after when I think this advisory committee really has to have that discussion about where do we want to invest mm -hmm. that money. If, if, if at a 50% uh, renewable level we have more money to invest in local renewable, uh, that sounds like a safer option in the long term uh, because that's renewable electricity you're going to be able to rely on. And yeah. risk is one of the things that was built into uh, your study. I, I think I want to hear this advisory committee talk about uh, what do we really value? Do we want to take the money that we might be saving uh, at a 50% level and invest that in local renewable? Or do we want to just maximize uh, the amount of renewable electricity we can have in the first year? We, we could have a long-term plan that starts us at 50% and adds 5% every single year, and we'd get to 100% in 10 years. But we. In the meantime, we would have invested so much more in local renewable. We'd have uh, solar panels on every single roof. We'd see investment by every city and, and the large companies in solar on, on their roof because we'd be uh, incentivizing. I think that's a value choice. So, so rather than just giving us the 80% is what we could afford to provide, what could we do if we provided 50% and looked at how much money we can invest in local renewable. I'd like to see those numbers as well. Yeah, no, I think I think that's absolutely um, an excellent point, and it's really uh, consistent with, with the way that, that we would look at it as well, is, you know, set set your content at a level that generates some surplus, and if you, you could use that for local renewable projects, you could use it for other energy-related programs to benefit consumers, use it to build reserves. There's a lot of mm -hmm. reasons, you know, rather than just trying to max that short-term uh, renewable content um, that, that it would be wise to, to do that. And then over time, and that's what the other CCA programs have done. They've set the initial starting point you know, lower than they, other, than they absolutely could have. And then the, the intent is to grow that over time, and, th and they've done that. Is there another question over here, I thought? Diane, go ahead. I think that's uh, move on to the, the next item here. Sounds good. All right, we're going to shift speakers here uh, for a time. I'll be back. But, so Brian Goldstein's going to take it from here. I'm Brian Goldstein with Pacific Energy Advisors as well, and you know we're going to walk through here um, the implementation plan. So as a aspiring CCA, it's the law. It's in the Public Utilities Code to submit a implementation plan to the PUC for their approval and certification. Um, what is the implementation plan, essentially? It's basically a guiding document of the planned operations of CCA. So it's something that says, this is what we plan to do when we roll out the program. We'll go through the different categories of what's in the plan. So essentially a roadmap that the PUC can look at, check various boxes to make sure everything looks in line and that this is gonna be a successful program in the future. Um, 
Oh, and the other thing really important to talk about is that this is a document that will need to be adopted in the public hearing. So I believe the first board meeting of PC, this is on the agenda to get adopted and then submitted to the PC for their approval process so that you can move forward with the program. Um, what it is not, it's not a detailed business plan. You're not showing detailed rate schedules. You're not showing which power projects you're looking to contract with. Um, it's again a guiding document and I think it's kind of an art form in many ways if you want to pro provide enough information to get certified, but you also don't want to provide too much to kind of ratchet yourself or kind of back yourself in a corner so as things change, marketing conditions, et cetera. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Yeah. So what is required? Um, one of the first things that's required by law is kind of the organizational structure. So how do you plan on staffing it? What type of operations will be within the CCA itself? Um, what are the roles and responsibilities of various staff uh, in the program? Um, so again, kind of just kind of hierarchy structure of what the program actually looks like. Um, a piece, big piece of that you see in the last sentence of the first bullet is the funding. Um, so what's your financing plan? How are you going to access capital um, to roll this program out? So you need working capital to fund the day-to-day -day operations of the program. Um, how is that actually going to play out? You know, do you have financiers in line and talking to banks, um, maybe a letter of credits involved. So that's one of the most important things. And it's also going to guide um, other areas that we'll talk about, such as phasing um, and things to actually ramp the program up. Um, so the next bullet, rate setting, is a, a piece of it as well. So how are you going to set rates? Again, not specifically these are the tariffs, the schedules, um, but more or less kind of what, what are the policies and guiding principles? So rate competitiveness will be discussed. Um, promoting rate stability uh, across customers, equity amongst customer classes. So different policy elements like that would be discussed. Um, as well as design. So do you plan on mim mimicking PG&E's rate schedules, at least the structure at a higher level? So again, not specific details, but enough to kind of cover what's the plan with respect to rates itself. Um, disclosure, uh, due process of, of setting rates, so um, a public um, proceeding, so board meetings, so there's public comment periods, um, and then, you know, after proposed rates may be rolled out, a period where the public can comment on that and actually have input to the process itself. So anything that's really promoting transparency on that level. Um, and then the last bullet here, um, methods for entering and terminating agreements with other entities. So for example, really kind of your procurement and contracting methods and practices. So um, for example, this is going to be a competitive solicitation process when you go out to the market to buy your power, or sole sourcing, uh, a policy that's also allowed as part of the CCA. So again, high level description of, of the practices itself when it comes to procurement. Next slide. So the, this, this one um, is important, you know, with respect to the rights and responsibilities, um, you know, of the program itself. Um, for example, Consumer protection is a big one, so noticing, so opt-out notices when rates potentially may go up. As an example, noticing your customers so that they have complete transparency into the program and actually what they're buying with respect to the commodity and, and the rate that they're paying. Um, termination of the program, so if something goes wrong, the program is to shut down and close doors, how would you essentially transfer those customers back to pg and &E service? So kind of more of a roadmap of how that would work um, with respect to those customers going back service. Um, and then a description of third parties um, that will be supplying power. So a uh, description of, you know, what type of entities there are. Do you already start the solicitation process to provide a list of, you know, the shortlisted suppliers potentially? Um, so it depends where the program's at with respect to the solicitation process, but the more information around that um, is, is more favorable. So this is probably one of the areas where you want a little bit more information than some of the others. Um, again, this would be the same as your data manager. So kind of discussion around what type of roles or responsibilities that data manager would be providing. Um, you know, and again, back to the procurement um, practice itself, how you're actually going to procure those services from those data managers. This is just really an illustrative example of here are the, the various requirements of the implementation plan, and then we use Marine Clean Energy's implementation plan to say, 
who are the various chapters in theirs and how here's the, how they align the requirements to the different sections of an implementation plan. Um, and as you can see here, there are definitely some overlaps with respect to their chapters and their implementation plan and how it kind of covers different requirements and sections by uh, or required by law. Um, you know, I think one of the things that will be good to talk about, and actually we go to the next slide because it's discussed there, is you've got these various implementation plans that have been filed and, and certified and approved by the PUC already. Okay, you've got Marine Clean Energy, Sonoma Clean Power, Lancaster Choice Energy, and, and Clean Power SF. And there are um, many commonalities between all of these plans. Um, and I think we'll talk a lot about Marine Clean Energy and Sonoma Clean Power. And you will see a lot of commonality. And I think the good thing about that is that th these are templates that have been approved already by the PUC, and PUC staff is already um, familiar with these templates. So with respect to PC, um, I believe the approach is to utilize one of those already approved um, templates, the ease of getting this approved and also the ease of, of it being reviewed and you know, trying to um, prevent any potentially questions that may not arise if, if something's familiar in front of the PUC's staff in this case. Um, next slide. So key, key decisions, and this kind of tees up the various key decisions. Um, John will talk a bit more about the specifics and some examples of some details. Yeah. My apologies, I was supposed to convey that message before I started talking, and I just got too excited up here, so. Um, so back to the, the key decisions and um, really the meat and potatoes of this, you know, number one is, is who's in, size, magnitude. Um, you know, that's very important with respect to how you plan to procure energy, you plan around your financing, um, you know, it all really starts around who's in and, and you kind of know the magnitude of the size you're looking at. Um, Another huge part is the description of service offerings. So what is that default product um, percentage renewable content? What's maybe, um, you know, are you gonna offer 100% renewable product, which, you know, is the case? Um, how are you planning on maybe scaling that base product in the future up to a higher content over time? Um, and this would also be the area, I know there's been discussion about I think certain communi communities defaulting to 100% product, you would, you would have those nuances if there's gonna be difference in, in base products for different jurisdictions. This is the, the piece or the part you would actually have that discussion itself. Um, description of the rates, the pricing strategy, like I mentioned before, it's really around the design. Um, again, not specific rate tariffs, but um, what type of rates do we plan on um, laying out? Again, is it similar to PG&E? Can you know, we do something different? Um, you know, what is the policies around rate setting? Um, again, I, I mentioned competitiveness, stability, um, equity amongst different customer classes, ensuring that you're covering your cost ultimately is one of the biggest drivers of rates. So again, discussion um, around that piece. Um, customer programs, so NEM, you know, also I think kind of fits into the, the rate piece. It's gonna be a schedule that's offered, but um, it's also considered a program. So you talk about that offering um, that type of product fit to the feed-in tariff, if that's something that's gonna be offered off the bat or in the future potentially, energy efficiency and other demand reduction type of programs that may be offered either upon launch or in the future potentially. Yes? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so the net energy metering, um, I, I believe most are familiar with, so it's the ability of you know, those of rooftop solar or any sort of you know, behind the meter generation um, to sell back uh, production benefit from. Um, the feed-in tariff is to promote local de development of renewable projects, typically a one megawatt or, or less, so they have specific contracts that you enter into to 
incentivize local development at that scale, and then energy efficiency. So I'm sure you know we've all heard a lot about the energy efficiency program, especially that PG&E offers um, on reducing you know different um, load characteristics of, of different types of customers. So um, those are more, more common ones. Yes. Uh, on the net energy metering. Didn't the CPUC act today on some of these rules? They, they did, did yes, did, yes. Maybe you could review the outcome of that. Um, I, I don't have too much. I think we looked at a couple emails. I'm sure John might be able to comment on it. I think one of the things we did see is that, um, I didn't see more of reading that there would be a, a PCIA assigned to NEM customers as well um, in the future. Some contention amongst different uh, commissioners as well. So, yeah, no, that's yeah. 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 so is that a good uh, description? Okay. Um, the next bullet here customer enrollment. So, when I was discussing um, a phasing plan, um, how are you going to roll the program out and what type of magnitude? And what I mentioned before in the first bullet is size is, is, is an important parameter to know, but the also larger driving parameter is, is your financing plan, knowing how much capital you have to, uh, available to you. So, you know, if, if you don't have enough to operate on full scale on day one, how do you scale up, build enough reserves that you do have enough money over time to get to the full load size uh, at some point in time? So a lot goes into kind of the phasing. Also, customer composition goes into the phasing strategy. And again, back to your financing, you know, if you need to, to build reserves and, and margins pretty quickly. Do you look at, for example, non-residential at first to build up that cash on hand in order to roll out to the rest to operate the program? So different pieces like that go into the phasing strategy itself. Um, and what I had talked about earlier, last bullet here, the organizational structure. So again, staffing, overhead, um, kind of lines of business, how this program would operate um, from that type of perspective. So I'm going to now transition back to John. He's going to walk you through some of yeah. Uh, is that what you mean by targeted groups? The yeah, usual yeah. groupings we all contemplate. Correct. Different Thank classes you. of customers, yep. depending Thank upon you. the rate structures and, and what that yields. Here we go. Um, so I was curious, like if if we have these, the template essentially that has been successfully approved, how much original work is required and how much do we get to sort of uh, piggyback off what's been done before? Yeah, I mean, I would say most of it, you know, from a content format, um, you know, probably a lot of the work is, is done. Now it's really just filling in the blanks of the numbers, the size, different metrics that are specific to the program, I think. You know, it's just laid out in a template form now. It's just filling in the pertinent pieces of information once decisions are made about you know, the size, the financing, what does the organization look like. So anything specific to the organization, I mean, you could take one of these templates, these documents, cut out any number, anything specific to those programs, and you're literally just filling in blanks, essentially. And then there may be items that are different uh, about this program that the other programs um, that exist didn't have or don't do or weren't in their plans that you might carve out and put specifically in this plan as well. So I would say a lot of the heavy lifting is done. It's not just making some of those decisions to populate the numbers piece of, of the plan itself. Um, I, I would go, you know, with 50%. I, I, you know, it's tough to say because, you know, a lot of the, the text is there if you adopt these templates, but there could still be a lot of heavy lifting with getting to the numbers, understanding you know, 
how are you going to fill it out, and how is this actually going to work for PC versus the other CCAs? Uh, my question was regarding the rate structures you just mentioned, the third bullet on the last slide. The way I see it, the customer is going to get a bill which will have composite of two components. One is PG&E component of transmission distribution, and one is our electricity generation cost that will be our PCE cost. Now, PG&E makes their rates right now under lots of schedules and a lot of different ways. They calculate bills based on peak demand and kilowatt hours, like time of day rates mm -hmm. or net metering you mentioned. Now, I saw on your previous slide that PCE would have the freedom to change those schedule definitions on its own. Then the bill would be composite of two different components being calculated differently, like PG&E's component might still be based on their rate schedule, like time of day, and uh, PCE might not be time of day. Correct. Am I right? Correct, yes, absolutely. We have the, the ability to adopt and set any type of rate structure um, you'd like. I think there's some um, you know, concerns or to caution you about potentially changing for example, time of use periods. You know, and that may cause customer confusion when they see the time of use periods different on one piece of the bill, like you had mentioned, versus the other piece of the bill. So that could, you know, cause issues there. Um, I think another piece that we've seen is the ease of comparison. So when a customer calls you said, "How do I compare it as a PCE customer versus a PG&E customer?" When you have different rate schedules, it's hard to compare apples to apples. So. Um, to be able to point to Apple to Apple and say, here's our rate, here's their rate, here's how much you save, it's, it's an easy way of communicating with your customer and, and explaining to them you know, what the potential savings there are under a PCE. So that's a good question. But yes, you are allowed to set any sort of design you'd like. Yeah. Um, what lessons learned do we have from the other jurisdictions, uh, sessions, how many iterations did they have to go through, what advice did they get in correcting deficiencies, if there were any, did, do we have that information? Yeah, and, and I think John can probably talk about it a bit, bit more than I am, uh, I, I can, but from my understanding, they were accepted, Marin, Sonoma, I'm not sure about Lancaster, but um, from my understanding that they were approved and there weren't issues um, with them, so. I'll turn it over to John unless there's something else here. I'll, I'll just uh, offer a comment on that last question. I think um, one of the lessons, you know, and we've been, we wrote Marin's plan and Sonoma's plan, so we've been kind of at this for a number of years. And uh, one of the lessons I would say is, is um, sort of less is more in a sense. And, you know, make sure you attend to the requirements, but there's no need to add a bunch of additional stuff in there because that just tends to trigger questions and it can slow down the review. They didn't, neither of those organizations had any uh, problem getting their plan certified. Um, but I do know uh, there was a, an iteration that had a little bit of extraneous information and that just triggered a number of questions that was sort of unnecessary to introduce. As a follow up, uh, what's the time frame from the time that it's submitted to the time that? Generally, you'd either get comments back, and then and then you'd have a chance to correct any deficiencies, and, and essentially, average time for approval. Yeah. Okay. That's that's a really good question too. So, th by law, the commission has 90 days to certify the plan. Um, in practice, they have turned these around. You know, I would say on average, 30 to 60 days. Um, it's it's a it's a bit of an unusual. It's not even, it, I guess it's an approval process, but it's, it's really a certification process. And um, it's not, the, the practice has, has been, essentially the commission staff looks to see that the elements that are required by law are included in the plan. 
Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a bit of a check the box type of a, a review. It's, it's not, you don't get there in there and second guess, well, you say you're gonna offer rates that are flat, for instance, but you know, we have concerns about that. It's, it's not that type of a review, it's, it's fairly expedited. Um, so I think for planning purposes, we need to assume 90 days and um, hope and expect, frankly, that uh, you know, they'd turn it around sooner than that. And, and we can work with them, your representatives can work with the commission staff to, to um, you know, brief them in advance and try and expedite the process. And, um, that's been helpful in the past as well. Yes, you have a question? So I noticed that part of the plan is um, potential um, energy service providers, uh, but the county hasn't released its RFP yet. Um, how does the timing of those two things work? How do you provide a list of providers when you haven't started soliciting them yet? Right. So um, that's a, another good question. Um, the Marin, is going back to the, the Marin and, and Sonoma, the way that they did it, they had actually issued their RFP and had received responses and had sort of cut it down to a short list. And so they, uh, both of those organizations included in their implementation plan a description of the solicitation process and even named the entities that um, may be selected. So they, they described their short list in effect. Uh, Lancaster um, submitted their implementation plan earlier in the process and they hadn't gone through that solicitation yet. And so Lancaster included a description of the type of services that they would be soliciting, uh, a description of their timeline for that um, supplier selection, and then generally the types of firms they would be contracting with, but not specifically, n n no names, right? Just like we're gonna contract with somebody that is licensed, has, has all the qualifications, et cetera. So I think that's what we'd be looking at here is following sort of that Lancaster approach based on the timeline that we have. Okay, so uh, the next two slides I'm, I'm not going to cover. It's really good summary information of these various items. It, it, I'm covering the same material in subsequent slides, but this is a, a nice sort of um, takeaway if you have a copy of the presentation, but it, it, it explains how MCE and, and Sonoma Clean Power um, address these key issues. Uh, but again, I'll cover that in a, in a different way. So we can just skip this and that. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through the, some of the key decisions that Brian uh, listed um, in a little bit more detail and also talk about how MC and Sonoma address these, um, these items. So the, the first one is the retail service offering. So this, this is the, you know, gets back to, um, you know, what is the default product in terms of renewable energy content or any other sort of attribute that, that would be connected with it and any optional um, products, for instance, the 100% renewable energy um, option. Um, so um, the way that, so I guess the, the key decision here is, you know, what should that look like? And then that, of course, influences your resource plan, your solicitation, you know, how much energy and the types of, of energy that you'll be buying through the, through the um, RFP. The way that MCE uh, addressed this is they, this was back in 2010, they started at 25% renewable energy content, which exceeded the RPS, the, the, the renewable standard at, at that time. And they had a plan to increase that, I think, to 60% by say 2015 and, and continue on with a, a long-term goal of achieving 100% renewable energy. Um, and that's, you know, that's pretty much what they've done. Uh, they've, they've steadily increased in their I think between 50 and 60 percent today, and they're on their way to, to 80 or 85 percent by 2020. Um, Sonoma, they similarly had uh, started off at um, a relatively low, although higher than the than PG&E renewable content, and then you know indicated plans to increase that that over time. And so that became the default tariff op option. So for MC, it was 25 percent renewable. For Sonoma, 33 percent renewable. Both of those entities have. Uh, version of the 100% renewable energy on a voluntary basis that customers can opt up to, but the default is at that lower level. Um, so, I mean, I think this is something, you know, clearly that we need to grapple with. Uh, 
We have the technical study to pr that provides good guidance about the relative cost trade-offs. Um, we have this more now uh, updated pro forma that you know we can use to to really, in a more granular way, um, model these different scenarios and different phasing plans, uh, etc. But um, I think this is one of the the key decisions that you know I think input from from this committee is is really important on. Rate setting, I, th I think some of this was really uh, already discussed as a result of your question. Um, but you know, one of the one of the keys here is structurally, what what is going to be the approach? So, is PCE going to offer equivalent schedules as PG&E? And there are um, a lot of advantages to that. I think the primary disadvantage to that is it's fairly complex. You might have 50 or or different rate schedules, um, or are you going to go a different route and maybe simplify the rate structure? Um, and I think I think Brian sort of already addressed some of those considerations. I think the other um, the other consideration here, and it doesn't necessarily have to be explicitly stated in the implementation plan, but what is the plan or what is the goal in terms of relative rates to the utility. So are we, are we really trying to, if we can, you know, undercut them and let's say produce a lower bill for the customer by X percent, five percent, whatever, um, is that what we want to do? Or do we want to essentially move much closer to rate parity and then generate more surplus for some of the programs that, um, or other, other, uh, other re, uh, you know, uses of those funds? Um, would you want to go that route? And it, it's, that's more important for figuring out how much financing you need and really kind of modeling the cash flows that indirectly feed into the implementation plan. So it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't need to ex be explicitly stated. But as we work through this, that's, it's going to be an important deci uh, decision is if, you know, if we can achieve savings, do we want to? Do we want to pass that directly to the customer or do we want to build some surpluses so that over the longer term, you know, those those savings can be provided to the customer. I think you were first. How do our, uh, in terms of, you know, like, like rate setting with the CPUC, how, are, how does our, cons how do our constraints from the CPUC compare to, say, PG&E's constraints? I mean, they have a four-tier structure. There's talk of reducing the two tiers. Are we, you know, if we, if we said, okay, there's no more tier structure, can we just do that? Or do we, I mean, how, to what extent do we have to look like PG&E just because of the, of the, of the CPUC requirements? Okay, so um, I guess I'll answer that a couple of ways. The, there's, there's no direct re regulation. There's no direct sort of control the CPUC has on PCE's rate setting. Right? So you have discretion how you want to set it. I, now, is that different than PG&E's or is it? Oh, yes. No, okay. PG&E's rates are regulated. Um, so, so there's a difference between how we're... Yeah. yeah, you're essentially self-regulated. The governing board, you know, adopts the rates. Um, PG&E, you know, has the CPUC as essentially the governing board or the regulatory body. Uh, so that's the difference there. Um, but, you know, recognize you only control half the bill, right? So the tiers, since you mentioned it, those happen to reside on the distribution side of the bill as it is. So if you look at the generation rate that PG&E charges residential customer, residential customers, it's not tiered. It's just a cent, you know, nine cents per kilowatt hour, roughly, um, regardless of your usage in the month. So all that tiering is on the delivery side. So there's not, not much you can really do about that. Um, some of the other programs, discounts, low income discounts, similarly, it, those are, those will continue to be provided to customers, but those are on the on the PG&E side of the bill. So there won't be any change to the customer to receive the same credits, but it's not, it's not something that PCE would have to deal with in its rate setting. Yes, sir. Uh, based on the Marin, Sonoma, Lancaster experience, uh, what do you have a sense from uh, uh, those programs? What percentage of people remain with the default versus what percentage of people go up or down or pick one of the other options that are not the default? Right. Um, I'd say, I mean, it's, it's very hard to get people to opt in 
to something. So, in, so the, the pretty modest, uh, you know, maybe two to three percent of the customers, roughly, have have opted up to those voluntary options. Okay. And in, in each of those cases, I'm less familiar with the programs. Is it always uh, an opt up? So people are opting up for more green rather than opting down for less green but lower price. Right. Right. So the the default is the lower. Uh, cost option and then the optional is is the premium there was I know some discussion uh, early on with the, the Marin program of flipping that and setting the default at the 100 percent and allowing customers to opt down but I think it sounded good for a while but people got concerned that you know with the opt-out nature of the program enrolling customers into something that's going to cost them more money even though you're providing notices and, and doing your best to inform them, there, you know, could somebody's not going to read the mail, right? And so there's some some concern that that may be not well received by by consumers. Okay, and then one final follow up. Um, it sounds like the assumption is that there'll be one rate rate program for the entire PCA rather than, for example, different defaults in different cities. Is that right? Well, it, you know, it can it, it can be that that other way, um, so that's it's not necessarily the assumption. That's none of the other programs. I mean, I'll, let me put it in the, in the affirmative. And the other programs have just as one default for the entirety of the um, it's called service area. So, no distinction there. I know there's there has been some interest in, in maybe changing that here for PCE. Um, we don't know of any legal or really technical reason why it couldn't be done. I think it would come with a, you know, a little bit higher administrative costs. The various notices have to be you know, customized and maybe some communications challenges as, as the program has sort of a marketing image. And if um, you know, part of that is, is maybe slightly lower rates, but except if you live in this area, you know, that there could be some complication there, but I don't think there's anything that precludes that type of an approach. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Earlier you mentioned that um, you would talk about if we went with a rate parity thing that you didn't necessarily think that was the best idea because you would want a cushion. So is this the point where you sort of talk about <laughs> what that cushion should look like just for viability and, and rainy day contingencies? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, and so, I guess, in terms of the, the, I mean, there's two things here. There's, there's where you set the rate. So you can set the rate at rate parity, but uh, establish your cost structure, you know, driven by how much, what the renewable energy content is at a, at a, at a lower cost, so that you're just essentially generating more surplus, right? So, um, and that's, that's kind of the idea of, of this cushion. So it may be, if you run the numbers, that let's say you could charge pg and &E rate and have an 80% renewable energy content, um, but the decision is let's charge pg and &E rate and have a 50% renewable energy content with the idea that we want to generate more cash for other purposes or just to build the financial strength of the, of the organization and ultimately provide, I mean, all the benefits flow to the customer at some point, right? So it's just a matter of whether it to uh, you know, flow it through is higher renewable content from the beginning, maybe lower rates, or you know, generate surplus or develop these other programs. So um, I guess in terms of you know, what is the appropriate balance there, um, was, is that a, is, is that something that you want to sort of? Yeah. Okay. So. I would I would approach it this way. I would I would start with what would be a service offering that is compelling to you know to your, to your customers and to the community. Um, and you know if 50% seems like a good product, um, that's what that's what I would I would go for. If if people feel that well, 50 is you know not enough. 75 would be good, and you think you could do 80, then, you know, start rationing it down. So, you know, I think the what you want to do, and, and this 
this is really something that ultimately you won't know with certainty until you go through the RFP and you have actual supplier prices to evaluate. So, you know, I think the ideal situation would be to set this content at a level that you're, you're pretty much certain you can hit. You know, I would say 50%, you're pretty much certain you can hit. And you may be able to do better than that when actual prices come in and, and, and maybe um, you bump that up a little bit. But I think there's a, a lot of value in, you know, giving yourself that flexibility. So I, I think, you know, from the modeling that we've done, 50% is clearly doable. Um, you could probably go higher than that. But is it wise to go higher than that? I don't know. I mean, I, it, it's really kind of a judgment <laughs> call, and policy um, call on, on your part. All right, so um, two questions. Um, do you envision the establishment of like a rate stabilization fund where the surpluses would, some of the surplus would be kept there to, to kind of manage perturbations as it goes from year to year or even from quarter to quarter as the rates might change? Uh, and the second question is, and, and you kind of alluded to it, if we're mimicking PG&E rates, um, but if we choose not to, are there going to be the programs such as PG&E has for, for example, for elderly people or low income and elderly people, uh, like in the winter time, they get you know, reduced rates in their gas or whatever. So, so are, is there going to be that type of service or special programs, um, you know, for, for those classes of people? Right. So for that second question, yes, because those, those programs are... Um, provided through the delivery side of the bill already as it is today. So it, it doesn't really matter um, if there's a different generation provider, those, the customers still receive the same benefits. So the, you know, the, the baseline raise, the, the medical baseline, the low income care program, um, there's a number of them. Uh, there's no change there, regardless of what, you, what PCE were to do with its rate structure. Uh, the first question, rate stabilization, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we look at that essentially as, as, a, as a cost. So when you go to set your rates and um, you know, build in that 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 planned contribution um, to a reserve, and you know it, something like what the other programs have have used is three to five percent of revenues is uh, targeted as a, 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 in other words they set their rates at a level to generate a reserve contribution of about three to five percent. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yes. There we go. Uh, okay, I want to speak to the rate parity issue again. Um, and just note a couple things because I, I think that um, it's really important to sort of weigh the benefits of, of cost savings versus um, allowing the county and allowing member cities to reach their climate action plan goals and, and bring the environmental benefits to, to uh, the cities. Um, you know, with the initial enabling legislation that created CCAs or CCEs in California, um, I think that the intent was stated quite clearly that the program is really oriented to bring Californians clean energy and not so much a rate savings plan or, or a, a cash flow plan. And so I, I think that we have to consider um, what the intent behind CCA or CCE creation is. Um, and at previous meetings I've asked, you know, what are the county climate action plan goals and how does this program, PCE, fit into achieving city and county goals? Uh, so I did go ahead and crunch those numbers. It's pretty easy. I can share our analysis with anyone who's interested. Um, it looks, the county has an ex excellent climate action plan, by the way, and it looks like there's a goal of adding an additional 7% greenhouse gas reduction on top of what the state is doing. So that translates to about 55,000 metric tons. Um, and if we look at rate parity plans for PCE, bringing in 80% renewable power, that would achieve almost half of the county's goal. So I think it's really important to consider because if 
um, we're not maximizing clean or, or low carbon or renewable power in PCE, the county and the, and the member cities are gonna have some really hard choices about what measures it's gonna take to achieve those goals. And it seems to me like those other measures available to the, to the county and to the cities would be a lot more expensive. So I, I think somewhere along the way, that cost analysis needs to be done. If PCE isn't maximizing clean power, what are the other measures that we can do and how much should they cost? Um, and one other thing, and I don't, I don't wanna take up a ton of time, uh, one other thing to consider is um, as we transition away from fossil fuels and we see more and more electric vehicles in our vehicle fleet and sort of um, dial back our natural gas use, that means a growing electrical load. So as, you know, and of course we're making every effort to be as energy efficient, but with a growing electrical load, I think that we have to be really mindful of not allowing um, a creep or an increase in carbon emissions. And so that initial setting of, of how much clean energy we wanna bring in is really important. And um, lastly, I'll note that of course we really, um, we um, support a buffer or a rate stabilization plan. And I think it'd be helpful at the next meeting to have a couple of numbers of, um, you know, how much of, uh, how much do we have to dial back on rate parity to create a strong rate stabilization fund? Would it be 3% or 5% or what, uh, are there numbers behind that that we could see? Thank you. Irby, a couple more questions. Yeah, uh, related di to Diane's comment, a, a number I would like to see, I don't know if you can get it off the cuff or in the next meeting, is, you know, if, say, 80% of the county chooses a 50% default, what kind of a percentage decrease is that in the carbon footprint of the county? Is, is that a number that can be? Well, you know, I think that, the, the, yeah, the technical study quantified the yeah. GHG reductions. So I think, I think we already have that, okay. that number. Yeah. Thank you. That would be scenario two. Yes. So my question is um, whether the customer, whether business or residential, what, whether the selection that they make for um, the type of renewable content, whether that selection itself becomes publicly um, you know, discoverable or known information, because I can imagine that you know, well-known businesses would want to be able to say that they're choosing 100% renewable or something close to it, you know, sort of like you know, businesses saying that they have lead gold buildings. Um, so we, we, if, if that's the case, that it would be public information, then we should think about how to harness that, um, you know, that possibility to incentivize businesses to start out with a high level of renewable content. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great point. And, and there are, I know, the um, programs that, that do that. So, um, you just want to, of course, you don't want to do that without the, the customer's consent, but there's certainly sort of a joint you know, joint publicity, joint marketing uh, campaign that could be done with those, with those 100% green volunteers, and maybe you, you give them a decal or something to put on their business window. You know, there's a lot of creative things that could be done there. Uh, it's not public by by default, right? It's that's that that would be, uh, I think, confidential information that the pro, the PCE would, would would need to maintain, but um, if the customer was willing to let let the program publicize that, then absolutely. Kirby, or John. Yeah. Um, you, perhaps you can help us uh, remember the kind of the thinking in Sonoma, where you know their default rate, their renewable is pretty modest, right? It's 35 percent, right? And with Marin, I think they're now 55. I think they've bumped it up a little bit. So, you know what? It's kind of surprising that, that, that they're that low, in light of, you know, at least. Uh, 
if 80% is parity, you know, they've chosen 35 as their default. And do you have any, any kind of perspective on that? You know, I, I think some of that is, is really just a function of the market that they were facing at the time they were planning their program and then went into launch. And, you know, what I mean by that is renewable prices were a, a lot more expensive three, four years ago than they are today. So I think, you know, what's feasible now is a much higher content than what SCP was facing when it was planning its program. I think there was also a, a bit of conservatism there, um, just that idea of, you know, they had, uh, and still do as, as, as far as I know, you know, a lot of ideas about developing local programs, lo local renewable programs, energy efficiency, and so, uh, you know, those are typically, you know, local renewable projects are typically more expensive than some wholesale project that you could contract with in, in the Central Valley, for instance. And so um, I think there was a, a, a desire to have funds uh, in order to invest in those local local projects. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they did that by being somewhat conservative on the renewable content. You know, it's still, you know, the the, the, uh, the regulation at that time was also 20, 20%. Um, they found it better. The and time. so yeah. they were considerably better than the 20%, even at, you know, 35 but I think more, more is possible now just because of the sharp drop in renewable prices that we've seen in the last few years. Now, it just seems to me that this, this issue of what's a default product is, you know, one where people are going to have a lot of different opinions. I mean, there's a couple of different variables to solve for, right? I mean, there's one goal is maximizing, you know, carbon reduction. And another goal is um, making sure we, you know, build up some kind of a prudent reserve. And then there's a lot of our, a lot of our cities um, that although, I, although you know, we're, we didn't go into this with the idea of, of creating great savings for people, it's, it's still an important part of many people's willingness to give this a try. So, I mean, I, I guess maybe I'm just stating the obvious, but there's, there's a lot of competing goals here, and it just seems to me that of all the things we're going to have to decide, this may be the, the one, because this is all value judgment can't scientifically figure this out. So we'll have to kind of think through how we want to have that discussion. Yeah. Could I piggyback on that just a little bit? I think that to the extent that we change what PG&E does, that's how this program could get attacked. So if we change the rate structure, they'll, uh, those who want to attack the program will say that it either raises prices for the poor or that it is an incentive to, to folks who have plenty of money anyway, or it's just too complicated. It doesn't achieve its goals. I think that to, so to the extent that we can make it exactly the same as PG&E, it makes it simpler to explain. Um, so if we have a, a, a program where we're providing rates the same as PG&E, we're providing an increased percentage of renewables, and then we have excess revenue, and we're investing that excess revenue in local renewable project projects, then we can, I think, explain to the average citizen what this program is really about. It is about reducing carbon. It is about uh, providing parity in terms of rates. But it's about generating those electrons here. And I don't consider an electron that's generated in San Mateo County the same as an electron that's generated in, in Oregon for a lot of reasons, and part of it is the risk associated with this program. I think the risk goes down when we're able to build more projects in San Mateo County. Do you agree with that? Yeah, uh, generally I, I do agree with that. I, you know, um, you know, my only sort of negative reaction is I think there's a limit, at least in a short period of time, of how much renewable development you could do within the county right. um, and a cost issue. But that aside, Absolutely. And there's Sean from the audience. Sean. One of the issues that we got into with the, the rate parity discussion is that we set a goal of, of basically at the outset of meeting or beating PG&E, but really it was about meeting PG&E's rates. 
But then what happens is PG&E, as is their, you know, as is their practice, they will shift rates multiple times a year. And so all of a sudden you get into a position where you have a choice to make. Do you chase those rates all the time? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, you might remember this, that ultimately our board had to decide, you know what, we're not gonna get into that game. We're gonna set rates once a year. And that's, you know, there's a, a stability factor mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. So I caution you against this sort of hook around parity and maybe go back to this phrase of competitive rates. I also want to caution, um, as just an opinion, that I think, my opinion, if you, if you run this too close to the edge in terms of the razor's edge of cost parity and exactly how far you can go, the challenge is, as we've already determined, pg and &E goes like this, right? So there may be at some point where that razor's edge is out of whack with pg and &E opening yourself up to um, some disgruntled customers. So I just, my personal feeling about this is you've got to give yourself a little wiggle room on that rate issue um, and be sure that you don't get yourself into a position where you're chasing rates. Thanks. Okay, I think that's, oh, sorry, yes. So, so Sean, then, was the pg and &E rate reduction is actually Regulated, but that really doesn't that really have to do with the drop in the price of natural gas? And since that's what they're buying, when that cost went down, their rate went down. I and I, oh no, they're they're. Not really. Well, anyway, I, I'm just I'm just saying that that. What I think may happen over time, and I'm being spec I'm speculative here, but at some point we're going to have something a little more severe than we have now in terms of carbon, you know, a, a carbon tax. And my guess is, if the price of natural gas continues to plummet, I don't think we're going to. I don't think you're going to see that reflected uh, one for one in rates anymore. Uh, pretty soon. I mean, we're just we just need we just need to stop it. We need to need to reduce greenhouse gas, and I think CPUC is well aware of it, and the governor is well aware of it, and we keep pushing the, the target of the Category 1 requirement higher and higher. Uh, and I guess I tend to support the 80% scenario just because I think that that actually may be safer to some degree, particularly if you can, if, if you can get some kind of long-term contracts. Uh, I know you may want overlapping contracts that are stair steps, but if you have long-term contracts with Category 1, I just think that's, it seems to me that's the safest place to uh, have your generation costs and maybe the most, the safest and the most stable over time. Anyway, that's my opinion. Just, uh, just a suggestion, it's somewhere down the line, there's like, uh, there are three kind of levers that we're talking about, rates, uh, percentage of renewable and reserves and uh, the, the three R's um, and at some point just a table of sort of you know what happens as you vary the mm -hmm. rates what happens you, as you vary the renewables and you know our reserve accumulation rates just at some point we'd have that I think that would it is a value judgment but at some point just having those numbers we would all be looking at the same numbers you're discussing would be helpful yeah I mean there are a couple of other variables too I, you know load is a, is a key and yeah. that relates to the phase in plan which itself is influenced by how much, how much uh, financing you have available to launch the program? So it's it's, it's kind of a uh, there's a lot of variables to sort of try and optimize. But it's it's I, I use the analogy. It's it's like putting a puzzle together, and when you don't have any pieces down, you know it's hard to hard to get started. But once you get a few in, then you can fill out the rest of the puzzle. And you know that's what we're we, that's what we're doing over the next couple of months. Okay, so I'm, I'm thinking that um, if we knew what the fluctuation rates were for PG&E rates on an annual basis, I'm concerned that, you know, I, I suspect, and, and you're the expert here, that in the first year is really where you're going to see the most 
customers paying attention to the difference in cost between PG&E and the CCE. Yeah. So trying to get the, the first year rates to be at least in parity with PG&E or lower is, in my opinion, going to provide us with the, the fewest opt-out mm -hmm. so that we can get some kind of a stable program going. So if we know what that fluctuation rate is for PG&E on an annual basis and trying to, you know, get under that <laughs> um, to, to begin with would be really helpful for, um, I, I know at least, you know, I'm here representing the city of East Palo Alto um, because we're, we're hearing from the community that rates really do matter. We don't want to discourage low-income communities from participating in the program. Um, at the same time, you know, living in Menlo Park and having a lot of affluent residents nearby, that's also a concern for them. They, you know, they, they may not be um, sort of as interested in, in the renewable content as we'd like them to be. Um, and so this, this is really important for the first year to get that lower price. Right. Yeah, and, and I think the, the advantage that we have is that we know you know, pretty much PG&E's rates might change slightly um, over the course of 2016, but um, we know what we're, we're dealing with as of, as of now. So they, the rates changed on January 1st. The PCIA went into effect on January 1st. That won't change until 2017. Uh, so if this program can launch in, in 2016, this year, um, you know, we, we know what we're competing against. And that's, that's a huge advantage. Um, you know, what happens next year? That's that's more difficult to predict. Um, you know, we do, for instance, this PCIA increase was a was a big change from 15 to 16. Uh, you know, PG&E's rates generally go up. Sometimes they go down, and you know, we do have data on that. And there are some graphics, some charts in the technical study that plot PG&E's generation rates over the last five or six years, so you can kind of get a sense of that variability. But I think it's it's really nice. If we can get this program launched in 2016, we don't have that uncertainty. We, we pretty much know, you know what price we need to meet. And when we get the, the power supply costs in, uh, we'll know what the, what the costs of the program are and what the rates are that, that can be charged to recover those costs. And it's pretty straightforward analysis at that point of you know, whether you can come in below PG&E or not, at least for that, that first year. And I, I agree with you. I think the first year is really, really important. Uh, not only that's when customers are really paying attention, but I think it tends to set the um, the image of the program. If if you come in and you're you know a little bit lower, you know that's what people associate with you. If you come in and you're, and you're higher, I don't even know if that's a possibility. Uh, if that's you know, if, the, if, if if the program would move forward, if that were the case. But if if a program did do that, then probably in people's minds, it's always associated that it's a more expensive program. So you know, I think I think that's a very important point. I mean, that risk will first appear in 2017, right? Because I mean, we have all the data on, on 2016, we, we know what we're up against, but we don't. We have some pretty good guesses for 2017, but we, we don't know. That's right. You know, we have as, as good a guess as we can make, and there's, there's a basis for it, but In terms of know. having, per, you know, we'll have a certainty of being uh, uh, slightly, presumably slightly under uh, PG&E, certainly, but it'll be launched by October, that's only a few months, and then, and then we're in a, a, new, a new rate period. For PG&E, and I, I think it was my sentiment that I like to be lower than PG&E for calendar 2017. <laughs> of course, of course, and, and that's where you know I think this 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 discussion about where to set that renewable content, and this isn't where where it, where you set it forever. This is where where you set it initially, and you know I think being a little bit conservative there is is smart, just so that. When you get to 17, if uh, you know PG&E rates are a little bit lower, PCI is a little bit higher than you thought, you, you can still have a competitive rate. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then you know, if not, then you can you can ratchet that that content up. And I'm not saying you know advocating for one answer versus the other, but I, I am advocating for you know make sure you build a cushion in. How much that is, I think, requires some analysis and discussion. Um, but I think that's an important point. I was wondering, do you have more slides to this presentation? Yeah, we kind of took you off track. Is this a good time for general time? conversation? You know, that's a I, I, I do want to see more slides if you yeah. have them. Um, I, I also have, have a point to make. You know, Thank you for that, Kristen. So, so <laughs> I think I have um, I have a couple, but let me pick up the pace a little bit. I think this one is will go quick. These 
complementary complementary energy programs. Um, this is something that, in the implementation plan, you, you want to list that hey, we're going to offer a net energy metering program. We have plans to roll out energy efficiency programs. It's not something that needs to be detailed. Uh, you'll have supplemental documents, tariffs, you know, program design documents that get in the detail of that. So this is really high level. Um, and I think that's probably enough set on this, unless unless there are questions. So we can move on to the phase in. I think there this one. One question. Oh, yep. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry to sorry to rush through it then. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but if you had a couple more slides, it might be a good idea to go through them. Um, uh, but this is a very important slide, so maybe we could just take a moment. Okay. To look at it. Want to come back to this one, or you, did you have a question about it? You want to hold off? Okay. Okay. So, um, program phase in. This is something that you want to detail in your plan. In, in basically, you can enroll everybody in in October, or is it is it going to be staggered over some you know number of months, or potentially even years? And you know how how do you want to if you are going to phase? How do you define those phases? So is it by customer class? Is it by geography? Um, some of the factors I think to consider are again going back to uh, how much how much um, financing is available to launch the program. So the discussions with banks or whoever's going to provide the initial uh, financing that's required. You know that can kind of set the cap on how many customers you can enroll in this first phase before the program itself starts generating cash uh, to kind of finance its own expansion into the subsequent phases. That's, you know, Sonoma, uh, uh, Marin had a, a originally a three-phase uh, plan um, and uh, has since then, so well, so the first phase was um, residential, a small subset of residential. Second phase about a year later wa uh, was medium commercial, and the third phase was sort of everybody else about um, a year after that. So uh, Sonoma had a three-phase plan but wound up collapsing that into two phases. So they launched with all of their commercial accounts in May of 14, and then everybody else in October of 14. So they really collapsed the, um, the, the phase in. And some of that was they were trying to beat the clock on some pending legislation that would have adversely impacted them. That legislation wound up not not being passed, but they were um, concerned about that and wanted to get get the full rollout. Um, and Lancaster uh, has done a phase in two steps. So they started with their municipal accounts and then quickly, after a period of uh, four or five months, rolled out to everybody else in the city. San Francisco is starting with a phase one, which is relatively small, and they're, they're um, going to they're working on their phase and strategy. A lot of their, their considerations is tied again to uh, how much capital they, they want to dedicate to the program, um, and uh, you know externally, and then you know, versus how much uh, is allow the program to generate cash to to ex um, enable it to expand independently. So that, that's an important consideration. You know just how much how much financing are are, are you going to have available, um, and then you know what are some of the considerations of if we are going to phase the program, is it important to have a lot of residential in that first phase? Is it important to make sure that you know all of the cities are covered in that first phase? So some of the geographic considerations. So a number of, of things to think about here. Um, and there are also strategies that are really, if, if kind of that financial uh, build reserves is of paramount importance, then there are certain Ways to craft the the phases so that you know you maximize the the, the surplus that's generated and then enable you to grow faster. Um, for instance, you might start with commercial customers that tend to generate more margin, and um, and that would probably be sort of financially the most beneficial approach. But it, perhaps for other reasons that that wouldn't be the preferred approach. So a lot of a lot of considerations here. Um, I think maybe best to just leave it at that or take questions on, on phase in, but you know, this is something that, yes? It's the uh, obvious question, maybe it's clear to everyone else, but uh, 
what's the reason for a phase in rather than turning it on? Is it is it because to tie it into the contracts that you're signing up and that ramping up based on supply availability, or are there other reasons? Yeah, not so much that, um, but you know, it's there's a couple of I think primary considerations. One is just the readiness of the organization to let's say over the course of one month have 200,000 customers and be able to provide you know service to those customers in, in the sense of it when they call you've got folks picking up the phone and they you know they don't blow up the system the, you know especially during that op that initial opt out period you're going to get a lot of calls right so um, that's one of the considerations and then the other is is financial because you know, just the you, you need um, until like 60 to 90 days after service commences, you're not really seeing any cash coming in. There's a lag for the meters to be read, there's a lag for the bill to be cut, a lag for customers to actually mail the payment and then you to get it. Um, and you're, you're, you have expenses incurred. So there's that cash flow that needs to be financed. Uh, and so the larger that customer base is initially, the more external financing is needed. And you know, it, if, if, if you've only, let's say as an example, if you have 10 million um, at your disposal, that's how much you could borrow, then you know, that can define how many customers really you can serve in that first phase. If you have 20, you could serve, you know, you could maybe serve all of them. So you know, that's, that's a constraint. We can't just ask the county to cover the initial cash flow? Is I think you could ask, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, organization, this one I think is fairly self-explanatory. It's just kind of laying out how is, how is this going to be structured? You know, JPA is going to hire employees, a, a, a CEO perhaps, use some contractors, so just kind of a, a, the basic organization plan. I think that's under development now at least. Um, we'll have to confirm that, but that will that, have to be addressed at least generally in the implementation plan. Go to this one is I think we already covered this in, in response to a question about you know one of the requirements is a, a description of third parties providing services to the program and so the two main third parties typically are the the primary energy supplier and um, the data management provider data management provider is really the entity that uh, addresses billing works coordinates very closely with PG&E in terms of picking up the usage, calculating how much the PC bill is, sending that information to pg &E so that they can include it in the bill and collect, um, maintaining the customer database, issuing the notices, doing a whole lot of um, those types of activities. So that's typically a contractor because of the specialized systems. Um, it would be probably cost prohibitive to try and build that, particularly in the time frame. It would be impossible uh, to build something like that, I think, um, in the time frame we're looking at. So, you know, you, you want to address those those key uh, third parties, and um, probably, like I said earlier, this would be a, in, a, in a more generic way, kind of the types of firms that you'd be looking at, as opposed to the specific firms that you'd be contracting with. Uh, pro forma, this this is not directly included, but you know, this is uh, some of the information in the plans. For instance, the financing requirements in the, in, in the plan for that is a, a, is a, a fun, you know, comes out of the, the pro forma analysis. Um, the existing programs have included some projections just to show that the, the program is uh, financially viable. So basic kind of summary income statements, revenues, costs, surplus over the next five years. And that's, that's part of the template. So um, that all kind of flows from that, that modeling. Of course, the modeling itself, those projections are dependent on the decisions that are made in regards to rates, renewables, et cetera, all the, all the other key decisions. And hey, that's it. So I wanted to get back to that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, in anticipation of this uh, conversation, uh, some of the uh, supporters at uh, San Mateo Community Choice and Pacifica Climate Committee did some pre-discussion on what we'd like to see in the uh, implementation plan and the upcoming RFP because this may, I'm not sure this body will have a chance to discuss the RFP which is also a very important document. And so I have a, a handout here of, uh, which is really quite basic. Uh, we looked at the uh, county's original draft goals um, which are wonderful, really wonderful. And. Um, so that's actually on, on one side of the handout is the original draft goal uh, document of the county, which is in the, the binder for this group. Um, 
And, uh, and we just sort of t took a second look at, at those goals and saw that the county has done such a remarkably good job in a short amount of time at building in a number of those goals. And some of those goals are worth having another look at now that we're at the, at the phase in the, in the program to, to be making these types of decisions. Um, so we want to highlight some of those goals and, and bring them forward again, the ones that um, now is the time to really start digging into them deeply. Uh, for example, goal number three um, is to supply an energy portfolio that pr prioritizes development of local renewable resources and minimizes the use of unbundled re, uh, renewable energy credits. The county did such a great job in, um, in specifying that no Category 3 RECs would be used in the feasibility study. We think that's a great policy to move forward, but also to make sure that there's you know, some specific targets um, in, the, uh, in the RFP especially and some language in the implementation plan around that goal of prioritizing de the development of local renewable resources. Um, there's also a goal around creating quantifiable and equi uh, equitable economic development benefits in the region through job creation. Um, we support um, language to implement this goal in the RFP. Uh, there's a goal to promote regional energy conservation through cus um, custom programs. Um, it's important, I think, to have language around that in the RFP to make sure that we're, get we're getting respondents that are interested in, in, in doing that type of work. Um, in doing the working with local renewable um, providers to working with on-demand reduction, that we're we're getting the sorts of of, of yeah of, of firms that are, are interested in that work. Um, and uh, finally, goal eight: uh, promoting local and community ownership and control of renewable resources in order to spur increased community resilience to climate change, especially in low-income communities and communities of color. Um, Again, this is the sort of thing that might be just sort of general language in the implementation plan. Um, but we, uh, we also really support um, some specific implementation targets in the RFP. And I would love to hear what other folks here think about um, uh, how we can move forward on um, getting some more specific, well, at least having s these goals mentioned in the implementation plan in whatever way is appropriate for the CPUC, uh, but getting some more specific um, language in, in the RFP itself. I, I would love to respond and just say I, I support these wholeheartedly. I think what I see here is that um, you're, I don't think anybody here wants unbundled recs to be a part of this program. I think we set that out early on, and I, I think the whole advisory committee is supportive of that. But again, it's uh, having regional control, community ownership, local generation, so how do we maximize that? If we picked a, a reasonable number like 50% with a goal of reaching 100% renewable within, we're gonna decide whether that's 10 years or five years and it will probably end up beating it just because there'll be more uh, renewable out there to purchase. But if we said we're gonna start at 50%, we'll go up by 5% every year, we're gonna reach that 100% target within 10 years. But in the meantime, all of the excess revenue, which profit companies call profit or shareholder, whatever, uh, all of that excess revenue can be, inve um, can be invested in local renewable projects, projects that people own locally, that we control locally, that uh, where those electrons are coming from San Mateo. I think that I support that completely. So thank you very much for passing these out. Yeah, I'd like to echo, I guess, the, that comment. I think that the goal of, of how much renewable energy is in the content, that's, that is a very achievable goal. But I think a similar goal and one that we would have continuous improvement on would be how much is generated locally for not only security, to make sure that there's going to be a constant supply, but to make sure that the county actually is benefiting economically uh, and job-wise, you know, for you know, for the investment that we're making and the steps that we're taking, I think it's it's, it's critical that the majority of the work over a period of time is actually done here, uh, close to home.
I thought I'd respond. Um, I, I guess I'm going to go back to what you were saying earlier about what what we should include in the implementation plan and how you know how we really should just include what's mandatory. And you know I can having you know been through several iterations of similar projects that are not related to energy. I find that anytime it's extraneous information is provided, it just opens up a bunch of questions like, how are you going to meet these goals? And, you know, we're still working out all of these goals and, and rolling them in. And, and I'm sure there's going to be another product that this is going to be reflected in, I, I suspect. If I may uh, make a point to that. Um, a lot of these comments are actually also uh, oriented toward the RFP for the energy services provider. And it, that is so crucial, who we end up working with and the, um, how we describe our interests um, in that RFP will, will determine in many ways the shape of the program if we are, end up working with a firm that is really interested in working with local energy developers, that is really interested in, in the concept of demand reduction or if it's a firm that's, that specializes in, in buying solar from Bakersfield, and that's really all they want to do. Um, so I think, right, so um, there's just, there's that decision, what goes in RFP now, shapes the program for many years. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. This is uh, really for PEA, um, I guess, and, and I won't go into now, but demand response, energy efficiency, uh, energy storage, there are specific targets for uh, the CCAs, like 1% of peak load by 2020 for the PCE should be from storage, and it might be increased, they're considering right now increasing to that, to what the uh, IOUs, the investor-owned utilities like pg e have to get, which is 25 to 3% of peak load by 2020. So energy storage is important. Energy efficiency, all new homes in California should be zero net energy by 2020. All new commercial buildings by 2030 should be zero net energy. That's something else to follow. There are also demand uh, response auction mechanism that was just recently awarded. Um, there's opportunities there. I think MCE is getting involved in that or is seeking to get involved in, and PCE should be in the coming years. But the other thing is um, just now, just changing on the rates, there's the, the new PG&E offering that not maybe everybody's seen is the pg e Solar Choice, which is the, the 50 to 100 percent, and then you can contract directly with developers for between 25 to 100 percent of annual use. So they're really getting aggressive there, obviously um, very aggressive there. And then finally, just to PEE, I think there's the other parts under Section 366.2 uh, that I know you're aware of that I don't think you discussed. A statement of intent and provisions that provide for universal access, reliability, equitable treatment of all classes of customers in compliance with any legal requirements concerning aggregated service. I know you identified them, I think, in the last meeting. Um, and I guess that'll come up in future meetings. But that's just another part of in the implementation plan beyond what you mentioned. That's just for future consideration, obviously not for now. But just, sorry, Ted Howard, uh, consultant, San Mateo. Thanks. I, I'm Bill Knack. I have three quick questions. One is, um, um, who's going to be drafting the implementation plan? Is it going to be the county staff? Is it going to be PEA? Is it going to be both? Once it's drafted, uh, then what? Does it come to this body for comments? Is it just go to the JPA for review and approval? And then the last question is, uh, based on your success in the cities, when do you think the first JPA meeting will take place?
I, Janet Creech, Millbrae. Um, will the PEA slides be available online? Thank you. Hi, Michael Clausen, Menlo Park resident. Um, I'm thinking down the road, this committee sunsets, what, the end of February? And then the JPA takes over at some point. And I'm wondering how you can sustain community engagement. Some of the best comments and some of the smartest people are not, and in all due respect, there's a lot of great smart people, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of great smart people who are our, our, our local council people. But there's a lot of very knowledgeable and, and committed people here. And uh, I, I encourage, you know, it's going to be up to the JPA to decide how you get that community input. But I hope it's not just having people just have a two-minute comment at a meeting because that's going to that's be not, it, it's not tapping the highest and best talent that's available. And I think some kind of a community advisory committee, obviously it's just advisory, but some kind of mechanism to keep that, that com community participation will benefit the program immensely. Uh, my name is Simon. I'm a resident of Millbury, Simon Lopes. I was an uh, intern at Marine Clean Energy when Sean Marshall was on the board. Uh, I was an employee there, worked with John closely. Uh, this document you brought up made me want to have a comment. This is a great document. Some of these goals, I think, should have been part of the discussion earlier. And I want to sort of offer a counter to that 80% talk, that 50% talk. There is a way to do this at an even lower level that goes right down this list, one, two, three, four. Those are your primary objectives. Number one, lower her greenhouse gas emissions. Number two, keep the rates lower and competitive. You don't need to push higher than that because three and four are the important things for the agency. To have a NEM rate that encourages NEM development and brings more solar to people's houses, you can do that with a two cent bonus compared to Marine Clean Energy's one cent bonus. And that's something that's gonna build out more renewables rather than going straight to 80%, getting power from Oregon, getting power from Bakersfield. And then looking at number four, job creation. I work in industry. I work in Millbright. I'm at a storage company. If you do those kind of things where you make a rate that's a demand response rate that has high kilowatt charges, I'm going to build more projects in your territory. Uh, electrical, want, electric storage, sir? Yeah. Oh. Battery energy storage behind the meter. So I want to thank you for bringing this up and encourage you guys to look right down this list. I would recommend a 35% renewable level, a commercial launch. I would recommend, this is his opinions. And you heard uh, John was talking about 50%. He was straying away from 80. John Marshall came out to say, don't ride that line too close. Pay attention to those comments. Those are the important. Um, yes, I'm, I'm Donna Colson, newly elected council member from the city of Burlingame. Hi, Deborah Penrose, city council, Half Moon Bay. And Daniel Yost, newly elected council member from the town of Woodside. John Keener, uh, Pacifica City Council. Oh. 